Bibles, and we're going to take off at Proverbs 27. 27 and 25, 26 and 27. We're going to talk about growth. Growth is based on, watch this, keeping your vows, your oaths, your promises, and commitments. That's really what growth is based on. Why is that? Because growth builds confidence when you keep your promises, when you keep your oaths, when you keep your commitments. Because you can't grow if no one can trust you in what you're getting ready to grow in. So you must have your vows, your oath, your promises, and your commitments in order for growth to take place. Growth happens internally, and it also happens externally. Internally, you grow inside by placing the Word of God in you, and you become confident, and there's growth. If you think about, you're not the same person you were even today that you were last year. There's been a growth in you. You're not thinking the way you were thinking because there has been a growth. You have gained confidence because you've learned how to stand on the word of the living God. And that, in terms of keeping your oath, your vows, just as God does, see, it's a pattern that we must follow. If you want to be great, I'm always saying this, you must imitate the great. In order to be great, you've got to have an example of greatness. And whoever, who is the most greatest, the one who's most excellent, the most high. If we follow him, we can only be great because Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and he's the greatest. Amen? Amen. So we want to always remember that, and this is what God is talking about when we're talking about internal and also external growth. When you are growing internally, then you can grow externally because you have cleaned yourself up inside. Now you can clean yourself up on the outside. The outside is easy comparatively because if you're struggling inside, you're going to have a hard time on the outside. Oppression and depression and all of those uh, suppression, all of those uh, ites and all of those jergesites and uh, habitites and all those ites can torment you inside because they can do things to you. They will call ailments, sickness, disease, all of that, disease, stress, all of that comes from the internal struggle inside. So you must grow from that. You must Place the word inside of you that you may gain confidence and begin to keep your commitments because commitments and vows and promises is what God stands on. His word, he can, it cannot return unto him void. So you must be learned, you must learn to, when you speak, you must be able to stand on your word as God stands on his word. Amen. Don't speak it unless you really mean it. It's all right to say no. It's all right to tell someone, let me verify that. Let me pray over that. But don't speak something. Let your walk be your talk. Come on, somebody. Let your talk be your walk. Or don't speak it. You want somebody to have what? Confidence in you. This is what the external is about. The external. Because people, when you give your word and keep it, people begin to have confidence in you. And you begin to grow up. If you dress up, in other words, if you dress up your external, then you will go up. Come on, somebody. But that's what's keeping, that's why being on time is important. That's an external growth. Because people begin to respect. You respect their time, they will respect yours. There's growth for both parties. So we begin to understand that a little bit. And I wanted to talk about, and this is what God was speaking to me about growth. And growth Again, keeping vows, oaths, promises, and commitments. So Proverbs 27 and 25 shares it and talks about it in this manner. When the hay is removed and new growth appears. Notice, when the hay is removed. And let me tell you, those that don't know about the pastor, or I should say a pastor, meaning where the cows and the sheep live. You know, the shepherd, he is a shepherd, and then we, he what, takes us to where? Green pastures, and he takes us to, to still waters. So here, I grew up in the country, and here I know when you, if you've ever seen or ever, anybody ever been on a country road, the first thing you see, and you may recognize that there are bales, huge bales of hay, and those are generated by tractors, large tractors, that that pulls the grass from the ground, the tall grass, 
and churns it and turns it into a huge bale of hay. And they set it aside and they keep going. And then you see a several, and then you may see cattle on the other side of the road. This is what happens here. So then when the hay is put in bales, then the nubro startles. See how that works? So then God is saying here, he says, when the hay is removed, notice now the harvest of somebody. Watch this. The harvest from the bales have just happened. Uh, now everyone can eat, meaning the beasts of the field. If you have sheep or if you have cattle, the harvest has come and also new growth has come. Now the grass underneath that was underneath the hay or the old growth has now begun to grow. So first you must seek the harvest of the Lord. Oh, somebody, see, he says, I will bring, oh God, it's his harvest. He says the labors are very few. Oh, somebody, uh, but the harvest is plenteous. Oh, when you see the bales of hay, the cows are somewhat happy. Come on, because the harvest is there, but the man that's actually doing the harvest is few. He's only out there. It's usually one or two individuals on the tractors that are doing the work. So now the hay, though, is removed in terms it's set as a harvest. And here Proverbs talks about it. He says, when the hay is removed and the new growth appears, and the grass from the heels is gathered in, the lambs then, the sheep and the goats, Will provide, will, will provide you with clothing. And again, I grew up on the country and I, I, I was, we used to run the goats and the sheep down because that would become our means. Hallelujah. See, when you grow up in rural country, you understand these things. You take care of the animals, you take care of the land, and you look to God for all the rest. So here, Proverbs talks about, he says, when the hay is then removed, the new growth appears, and we see that in the grass. And the grass from the hills is gathered then in. The lambs will provide you with clothing, because if you ever know that a lamb, the wool, the clothing that you wear comes from lamb. If they're shaved, somebody probably didn't know that. Halloween didn't cost you nothing. Hallelujah, you just got something today. The lambs will provide you with clothing and the goats with the price of the field. Notice you've got the field. He provided you with the field and the goats came with it. Oh, somebody, you got to watch those goats though. Amen. Because the wolves are also, you've got to watch. They all That's all part of the field. <laughs> God gave you the field, but it all it comes with everything, everything that you know of. Oh, somebody, the harvest is plenteous. Come on. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So the harvest itself has everything in it. That's the harvest. But the laborers got to be able to take the wheat and leave the tare. Or take the wheat and the tare and then burn the tare, but keep the good wheat. You got to be like Jesus when he says, gather everything, the fishes, gather them all. He, he tossed the net out and then he gathered all the fish. He gathered them all. And then he gathered the net to where the seams were bursting out. They were full. Notice he gathered everything. And then they sit on the bank and they tossed out the bad ones and kept the good ones. We have to learn how to be discerning understanding and discerning the times you have to know how to flow in the harvest when we grow it you will have plenty of goats and milk to feed your family notice he's going to nourish you and everything about you he's going to supply all your needs this is how God does it he supplies everything that you need but then he gives you wisdom, discernment, and knowledge to determine how to get it out. Just like the, the hay must be the livestock. But how do you get to that process? You must first churn the grass. You must first understand that you must do something in order for that to happen. We begin to see how 
growth takes place. It takes place with us doing. It takes place by us being accountable. This is what growth is. Even in our leadership, we take hold of growth. Growth is happening, and growth must be applied. Here, I want to take you to another area of the Bible. The songs, the songs of songs, or the songs of Solomon, chapter 6. Take a stroll with me with this one. This is Songs of Solomon, <coughs> chapter 6. And we're going to take off at verse 11. And while you're going there, let me share something with you. And I've shared this before. The Songs of Solomon rep represents a love affair. It represents a favorite, the king's favorite. Out of all the harems, out of all the wives and the servant wives and the handmaidens that King Solomon had, he chose one sweetheart. One stood out beyond all the others, and this is their story. It's a love affair. And it's one that reminds me of Jesus, because this is about wooing a mate. When you know when you have been truly in love with someone, you have had to what? Woo them. You've had to place yourself vulnerably. You had to become vulnerable because you were loving them. You were in love. Now, granted, they may or may not have been in love with you, but you were in love. And at that time, that all, that's all that mattered. Amen. So, but this love affair was a two-way street. This is how you woo Jesus. Notice this maiden, this handmaiden, wooed Jesus. And the return was King Solomon making her his favorite. She was a Shulamite woman, but yet she was fair. She was considered very beautiful to him and very special. How did she get his heart? It's beyond me how this one woman stood out of all the rest and got his heart. But then I think about how my wife got my heart. So I begin to understand. So this is a story of wooing a mate. And I rate this for Jesus because this is how we need to woo Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they question him about his disciples. He says, why, why does your disciples not fast when we fast? Notice this was the Pharisees and the Sadducees questioning Jesus. And Jesus says, when the bridegroom is with them, they don't need to fast. But when I'm not with them, they have to fast. And why do we fast to bring Jesus in? We want to woo him. And this is the Songs of Solomon. It's wooing him. This is how you woo a mate. The same way you woo Jesus when there has to be fasting and praying. When you do not owe somebody. When you do not feel the presence of the Lord. Oh, you've got to take it a step. You've got to go to the next level. You've got to seek him. You got to find a place where it's just you and him, and you guys got to work it out. There has to be a love affair. Come on, somebody. God says, I love you. Oh, somebody, but you got to love God back. He says, I draw closer to you if you draw closer to me. I draw nigh to you if you draw nigh to me. It's got to be a wooing relationship, it's got to be a communion, it's got to go beyond what you know. This is how. The songs of Solomon was. This is beyond all the rest. Go, oh, somebody, you got to get to the best. And when you go to that secret place, you will know how to woo a mate. Think about how you were, again, in love and you were wooing. You were all messed up, all torn up inside. Just think if you had that type of relationship with Jesus. Oh, somebody. Hallelujah. Then, then everything that you need would be supplied. Oh, somebody. You wouldn't have to worry about a thing. 
because God supplies every need. Yeah. Oh, somebody, see, when you have a love affair with Jesus, see, when we make our mistake, we want to go have a love affair with everybody else. And they can't help you. They can't help you. They will take and steal what you got. Take your anointing. Bring you down low. And then all of a sudden you've got nothing. And then all of a sudden you want to go find your relationship again. This woman, oh, where is my love? She says, where is he? <laughs> she went looking for him. Because she didn't feel his presence. See, when you don't feel his presence, you need to go looking. You need to be praying. You need to go to that secret place. You all, some things only come by fasting and praying. So if you got a situation, you better be seeking Jesus. Oh, somebody, I'm just a messenger today. But somebody needs to seek him. Oh, somebody. Now look, Songs of Songs of Solomon, chapter 6. Let's look at this. This is her wanting to find out where he is. She get up and her lover, oh, her friend, <laughs> is not there. And she's asking folks, where is he? <laughs> but here she is. Look at verse 11. He comes and he tells her, oh, I went down to the grove of the nut trees. He went to a valley. He was so, he was you know, Jesus, how he would draw away to his own secret place at times. So he went to a valley to observe the creation of the Lord. Oh, somebody. See, you've got to get to a place. Oh, I love sometimes traveling places, and but I'm only looking for those quiet places. I love going to like the mountains or the lakes and the rivers and, and, and even the ocean so I can see the amazement of the Lord. I'm not interested in the buildings that men made. You know, when they offer me a hotel and say this is your view, I don't want to look at no high-rise hotel. That's all man. I want to look at the water. I want to look at the nice tree. I want to be able to look on the mountain top. You know, when in that case, I've been to the mountain top. I don't just want, I want to look how the rocks is carved and craved because man didn't do that. God said, I'll take the rock and turn it into water. This is what I want to see. I like to be like David. I want to see the creation. I want to see the precepts. I'm not satisfied with what man built. Man built the Tower of Babel. And where did that get him? I want to see what God did so I can look at the amazement of God. So here's Solomon. And she's looking for him. She's yearning for him because he wasn't there that morning. She asked her friends even. This is chapter 6 if you want to read it. And she says, verse 11, I went down, he says. He's speaking to her. I went down to the grove of the nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley. <laughs> Here he was. He went to a wonderful place that God had created. But he knew there was new growth. Oh, somebody. He was expecting with an outstretched neck of expectation that God was going to do greater works. He was not resting on his laurels. This boy had it all. But he went in the amazement to see the creation of this beautiful garden. That's where he went. She was looking for him, and he was somewhere just praising the Lord. Because he knew the growth of it. He desired growth. So here he was. I went down to the grove of the nut tree to look at the new growth in the valley. To see if the vine had budded. Notice, he wanted to see the new growth. See, we are a, what, new creature every day. So there is a new growth that we must embrace. There is an internal, there is an external. I say it again. Because God wants to see us grow. 
He doesn't want to see us sick. This is why leadership is so keen. You cannot just sit on a pew. God, oh somebody, is wanting you to grow. He can't use you if you don't grow. If you don't step out on his faith. Because why? There are so many hurting folks behind you that need you to be prepared, need you to be grown, need you to be eating meat, and because they are right now sucking on milk. Yes. Amen. And he needs you in place. This is why I preference growth being nothing more than vows keeping like God. Oh, somebody, be like Jesus. Oh, he kept every oath, every promise, every commitment. <laughs> Examine yourselves in this area. Oh, somebody, here this boy was, looking at the new growth in the valley. He was amazed because he knew what was coming. He wanted to see the vines that had budded of pomegranate. I know there is something in pomegranates because this was a favorite vegetable, not only of the people of God, but even of Jesus. Pomegranate juice. Oh, somebody, if you haven't tried some, you need to drink some. Oh, somebody, feel the anointing of the pomegranate. And they were blossoming. They were growing. See, that's an internal thing that you drink. But it's an internal growth because now you're getting spiritual. You're tuning in with the customs of God's people. Oh, you can say what you want about the Jewish customs. But Jesus says, I didn't come to change a thing. <laughs> he just added to them. We forget that. We being Jews ourselves, because Jesus was a Jew, he also was a Nazarene. Samson was a Nazarene. We forget the things that Jesus was linked to. His own heritage, which gives us the same inalienable rights because he adopted us. See, you begin to grow. You can't just sit still with all this knowledge and power that you have. Oh, somebody, and the lineage that you come from. You come from a powerful elder brother who sits at the most high God's right hand who says to him, sit down, son, at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Grow! When you begin to understand in your mind who you are, who you're connected with. This is key. Before he says, I realized it, verse 12, I may desire, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. Once he began to understand the growth and how God creates and he grows, he set his heart on the people. Every good leader understands that. When you begin to understand things, you set your heart on the people. Because then you begin to understand that they also need to grow. Yes. You begin to understand that my people, somebody say my people, my people. Perish. perish. No, actually they are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge, because of a lack of growth. They don't want to grasp Jesus. There's no growth internally. Therefore, there won't be any growth externally. They will perish. They will be destroyed. This is what he realized. He went to seek. His, he went to seek something greater than what he had somebody. He had the love of his life, but he didn't go. He didn't go back to his concubine. He was out in the garden. For well, the garden was blooming. Well, he understood that the creation of God was moving. 
And he knew there was new growth that he needed to see. When he began to understand that, then he set his heart on his people. Because he was a king, he had to manage his people. This is when he, would, he understood God. Not as latter days, we understand that. But we, don't want, we also understand that it was an example set forth for us not to fail. We've all been there. Oh, somebody, you can. That's why God said, don't judge nor condemn him. We all have been somewhere near where Solomon has gone. Mm -hmm. We all have been somewhere near where David has gone. Come on, somebody. Adultery, mm -hmm. fornication, mm -hmm. you know, murder. He said, well, Pastor, I ain't murdered nobody. You know somebody that did. Abortions are murder. Come on. So then you understand what David went through. You understand what Solomon went through. He couldn't hold his flesh. That's all it was. He couldn't control his flesh. He allowed man and praise to uplift him. And he couldn't do that. That's why we give God highest praise and we take none of it. His glory. Amen. So we begin to understand this. Let's finish this up and I want to tell you a story. You know, I always have a story. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. You know, this is one of my wife's favorite prophets, Ezekiel. Hallelujah. Ezekiel, let's take off at 17. This is really key. And this is a good read. It's about, uh, let me just preference it. It's about a story of two kingdoms. And God depicts this in a parable. He talks to Ezekiel and tells Ezekiel, the prophet, to go tell his people about this parable. And then he takes it further in the parable. He tells him about two eagles. Because eagles in this parable as powerful as kingdoms. So he uses the analogy in this instance to explain to us how he grows his people and those that rebel, he takes it over himself. So in this chapter, Ezekiel 17, this is two eagles and a vine. Notice, we talked about this vine. Solomon went down to see the vine the new growth came and Proverbs where it appeared where we, we understand about the pastors in terms of how that growth takes place, how we're new creatures in all of this and where God wants us to be. That's why he wanted us to be new creatures because new creatures are growth, isn't it? You know, you're shedding the old man and taking on the new man. But look how God depicts this in Ezekiel 17, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set forth an allegory, and tell it to my people, Israel, the Habakkians, as a parable. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. A great eagle with powerful wings, long feathers, and full plumage of various colors came to Lebanon, taking hold of the top of a cedar tree. And anybody ever watched an eagle? I love watching eagles because they represent one of the they, they represent one of the four beasts, or either they're part of a four beast and then there's five. There's the man, the ox, the lion, and the eagle. And they all have heads on one body and wings that spreads and eyes in those wings. If you ever Ezekiel talks about this immensely, he gets deep into it. So this is, so the eagle is very significant here. So God uses parable to talk about this eagle. Imagine this eagle, he's on this, if you ever seen uh, an eagle indoor, uh, watch Discovery in some of the countries that they go filming, the trees are so high. I mean, it's just the trees that they settle in is the highest tree. And they build these huge nests in the top of the tree, the very tip top, where the tree is touching heavens almost. It's so tall, you can't even look beyond because when you're looking at the tree, you're almost like looking in the clouds, just blinding. But the eagle lives there. Look what he does. He takes hold of the top of the cedar tree 
He breaks or he broke off the topmost shoot like a, a branch. So he breaks it off and he carries it away to land, to the land of the merchants. Notice, to the world. He takes the top of the tree, the branch of the vine, and he heads to the merchants. Where he planted it in a city of, of, of vendors and people that trade goods. That's where he went. He went to go share what he had with the people. There it is. This is what he did. And then he took one and then he took another. He, 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 then he took one of the seedlings of it, of the land, and put it in the fertile soil. That's what we do. We should be planting in fertile soil. The Bible talks about the parables. We know about that. That if you sow your soil, if you sow your seed, it should be on good ground. It shouldn't even be on the stony ground or the bad ground or, or any of that. It should be in good ground. The Bible tells us this is why you have to be careful where you sow your seed. The Bible clearly says don't cast your pearls to swines. We have to be careful who and what we give our money to. You have to plant seeds in the right place because your seeds should always give fruit. Oh, somebody, did we forget about the harvest? Come on, somebody, the harvest. In other words, oh, somebody, if you're going to plant, plant in the harvest where you can see the fruit when it's time to harvest. This is why God sometimes takes over the harvest because we don't know how to plant. Let alone garden or indoor nourish. He gives us these things. He gives us the whole pasture. He gives us the whole field. Grow. To grow what he has. To grow inside. To grow what he's given us. But we plunder it. We don't do what he tells us to do with it. So this parable says he planted like a willow by the abundant water and it sprouted and became a low spreading vine its branches turned toward him but its roots remain under it notice the roots when you plant something it must have good roots come on somebody if you don't have good roots, if you don't have a solid foundation, somebody, you can't stand it. Your roots must be seeded properly. It must grow. <laughs> your roots is your new growth. Wherever you take a stance, wherever you make your decision, it must have good roots for it to flourish. That's why your, your, your faith is a seed. It's, it, it's as a mustard seed. But then when it grows, it becomes the largest tree of all, where the birds and everyone of the field can rest and take hold of it. But if you don't plant the seed in good soil, if it doesn't take root, notice, this is your faith. If you don't plant your faith perpendicular, if you don't plant it right, go somebody. You can't receive any fruit. The harvest, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers, you are the laborer that God has called. You must be willing to work. You must be willing to plant. You must be willing to help it grow your faith. You must be willing to understand what God has called you to. You must be willing to understand how leadership is going to cause you to come higher. You must understand these things. Notice this eagle planted. Its branches turned toward him, but it was rooted. It roots, its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out leafly shoots and strong branches. So he planted right. He did, he trusted God and he planted right. 
He took what he had off oh, somebody because he was the top of the chain. <laughs> he had that tree, but he took it. He took it because he wanted to see you grow. And he planted it in a place where it could prosper others. Oh, somebody, somebody's going to get this. Amen. And then he watched it grow because God had orchestrated it. Now, on that same note, here comes another ego who also had great, he, he had great, he was great powerful with full plumage. That was another ego. But he did, he banked off the first ego's success. But he did it illegally. He didn't keep the vows of the Lord. He didn't do what God called him to do. And of course, if you don't do what God calls you to do, it will kindle God against you. God was kindled against the second kingdom or the second eagle. So here, then God had to step in. And notice what he did when he stepped in. Look at 22. This is what God does. He will step in. He will step in. Watch what he does. Look at 22. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because the second eagle didn't follow the commandments. He says, this is then is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take the shoot from the very top of the cedar and plant it. <laughs> See, you have to understand, dear ones, we're not indispensable. You ain't all that in a, 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 a glass of tea or whatever, or, or some chips or whatever it is. You ain't all that. Oh, so if you don't do your ministry, God will raise somebody up. And you'll be standing on the side. Well, how did that happen? Yeah. If you don't do what his commandments, he'll, he'll do it himself. If you don't praise him, that's why he got the rock standing by. He's waiting for you to slip. He waiting for you to not want to. He waiting for you to don't want to use your free will. And he had that rock standing right on up. Yeah. I've seen the rocks praising somebody. And in a, oh, a vision, I've seen the rocks praising him. I've seen the trees wave and praise him. He wouldn't have showed it to me if he didn't tell me or if he wanted me to know. He says, your job is to tell the people because my people perish. Nobody's going to be able to say, well, I didn't know. Because God wants you to grow. It's all about your growth. See, we have to understand God's always creating people. <laughs> They've been born every day. Are you going to be a benefit? Are you going to be somebody? Are you going to be a hindrance or a help to the kingdom? Because he wants to use you if you want to be used. That's why he gave you free will. And he wants to bless you in this. Oh, somebody this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take the shoot from the very top of the cedar tree and plant it myself. I will break off a tender sprint of it from the topmost shoot and plant it on a high lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, he says, I will plant this thing. And it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendor cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the tree of the forest will know that I, the Lord, brings down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. There it is. <laughs> he will take, oh, somebody. He's always wanting the humble so he can use us. That's what it's about. He's wanting you to grow. He gets the glory when you decide to do your ministry. When you act upon what he has called you to do. When you say, be like Isaiah. I'll go, Lord. But how will I speak? And God said, wait a minute. Let me just put some coals on your lips to clean them up. So all you got to do is be a willing vessel. As I like to say, a conduit. And let him use you. Don't say what you ain't going to do. Oh, somebody, I tried that. Oh, oh, somebody, did I get smoked? Oh, somebody, and it wasn't pretty. Oh, God, no, not me. 
And he kept putting this stuff right in front of me. Boom, 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 boom. I said, oh, no, boom, 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 boom. Loud, boom, 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 boom. When you steal it, hit, you get it. Boom. <laughs> he slammed me down. <laughs> then I said, well, let me get up. You know, I told y'all the story, the story that my wife shared with me about the minister who said he, he wasn't ready yet. He got knocked down. So just do. God called you. God knows what's in you. God, God, God's going to use you if you allow him. He knows what's in you. Because if you don't utilize what he has called you to, he will not only bring you down, but it will put you, you'll be in shame for not using what he's called you to do. I'm always reminded of great, great, great folks that had an anointing that God blessed them with. Anybody ever remember Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson? Great, 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 great anointed people. What did they do with that anointing? At the end of the day, all you remember is how they failed. That's all you really remember. And a lot of us can't even listen to their music. Even when it's the younger day, we can't even listen to it. It doesn't have the same beat. It doesn't have the same sound. It has nothing to do with you being a Christian or whatever, or a believer. It just doesn't do for you what it did. Because of the way they fail. Because their anointing didn't come out great. They did nothing. To make you really say, oh, somebody. But if you say MLK, that's a whole different anointing in it. You say, wow, I remember him. He did something great. Oh, somebody. He was always praising God. Oh, you, oh, you can, people will say what they want. He was this or that. But that man, somebody, he was always praising God. And guess what he did as he grew? He branched out and gave to the people. The people, a lot of them went on to be great. A lot of them went on to have ministries. Some fell by the wayside, but nevertheless, his name, you remember his greatness. Just like the name of Jesus, although there's no comparison, but you remember the greatness because he grew. He grew. He did what God told him to do. He grew. He wasn't like the second eagle who disobeyed God with the anointing. This is what God wants us to have today in this message of growth. This is how he wants us to understand there's a higher calling on your life than you thought. Oh, somebody, let me end with this. I tell my wife this all the time because we both, we both always have to be reminded. Powerful minister, his name is Benny Hinn. He had a vision one time and he shared this. He woke up one day because of the frustration of the ministry. Things weren't going right. So he told God, he says, God, you know, I, I just can't do this anymore. People are all mad at me. They, they don't like me. No matter how much I do for them, they curse me. They write nasty things about me. And then when I, they don't believe me when I, I tell them that they're healed sometimes. He says, I'd just rather just go away and be a small time little pastor. That same night, God came to him in a vision. He took him to a high place. Why does God always take us to a high place? <laughs> because he's not a low God. <laughs> so he took him to a high place. And on that high place was a plateau, and there was a huge cliff, and there was millions of people. And he was standing there with the angel of the Lord watching them, and they were falling off the cliff. They were falling into the lake of fire. And the angel of the Lord looked at him and said, you are the reason that these people are falling into the lake of fire. And if they continue to fall, I'm going to hold you accountable. Oh, that woke him up. 
<laughs> because he didn't want to go to the lake of fire. So now he said, oh, no, I've got, I got to do my ministry. <laughs> so he got up and started preaching like he ain't never preached before. And that was the man of God. You know how somebody, I have been to many of his conferences back in my younger days. So I understood where he was. I, I understand those things. It's amazing to me, though, how God does meet sometimes. I'll be out going to churches where I can speak. There's two, three hundred people. <laughs> but then I'll be here. But this is what God said. I, what I was, oh, somebody, let me, I'm, I'm trying to finish. I, I, God knows I'm trying to finish. I, I, I go to, oh, somebody, I go to, and this is what really blew my mind. I, I, I mean, you know, and I'm always using Russia, but I, I was on Russia's national TV with the highest priest in the land. I was standing there ministering on TV and also a thousand people in the congregation. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I'm going wild. Then when I flew back, here I was again. And I mean, that's the type of stuff that God will do. But then he lets you know that he's going to use you. I walked around with an interpreter. <laughs> I mean, that was just amazing to me. I'm always thinking about, I'll tell my wife, I'm, and I'd go, I went to huge castles, man, and over the ocean, you know, all that stuff. And then God brings me back. <laughs> I mean, really? You know, I can imagine how Jesus goes out of place, coming back to you, you minutes. God called you. You are to grow. He's preparing you. Because all of you, he's going to tap on the shoulder. He's going to want you to minister to someone. Not only minister, there's a work that you must do. You must work in the trenches. Jesus worked in the trenches. We, we, we forget that. Yes, he, he went everywhere. He went to the tabernacles. He worked. Oh, he was lifted up with the 5,000 and all that, but the boy did all of his work in the street where there was only like a, a, a handful after he healed the handful, yeah, the multitude came, but he was always in the trenches. We forget that. God has a mission he's going to call him for us. This is what the Lord says. He says, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendor cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make low the tree that grows tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. That's what he does. Isn't it? <laughs> he takes the small things and makes them great. He takes the humble and makes them great. He doesn't like the proud, the arrogant, the pointing of the finger of the evil eye. So therefore, I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it, he says. I will do it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today that there is a newfound unction in the people. Understanding that this growth is happening inside Hallelujah. And we bless all oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. So it's no coincidence or happenstance today that there is a new growth in Sister Gloria. And she's been honored today for that. So I thank you, Holy Ghost. God is good in it. Hallelujah. He brings his word full circle so that you'll get a clarity in what he's saying and doing and how he's going to do it. To show you how important new growth is to you. He's, no, he's, he's, he's doing a renewing of your mind and a refreshing of your body today. So, Father, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus to bless your people that they truly know and understand what you're getting ready to do in their lives and how you're raising them up to be a beacon of light. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.